right, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all this morning. Welcome to church. Sorry about that. They, I threw them a song now. So he's playing drums, as you know, not too long now. I threw it his way. I told him that, um, yeah, that's playing with us. <laughs> so bear with him yeah, this morning. But welcome, amen. As we've come together on this morning um, to worship the Lord and to praise His wonderful name. Um, I just want to take us to a passage of scripture that I was sharing with the team this morning. And that being out of Psalm 29 and 11. Uh, Psalm 29 is such a most wonderful passage of scripture. Um, and an incredible song that's written by the psalmist. But verse 11, you know, it's, it's such a profound sort of conclusion to the psalm. Um, that the writer says, The Lord gives strength to His people and He blesses them with peace. And, um, you know, I, I wonder if you are maybe overwhelmed or, or maybe, um, maybe tired or maybe weary um, or maybe feeling like you like may, may not have enough strength to go on. Or maybe just feel over, overcome by by situations or circumstances in your life. I just want to encourage you this morning. This is a song, by the way, because the Psalms are songs. And um, the writer of this song says that the Lord gives strength to His people and He blesses them with peace. With peace. And I was, um, as I was sharing with the team, I share with you this morning, we, we often consider... Um, blessings in, in, in the tangible or in the natural, you know, like we get excited about maybe when God blesses us um, with a new job, and which we should, um, or when He blesses us with a home, we should get excited about that. When He blesses us with a husband or a wife, we should get excited about that. Um, when God blesses us maybe with a car um, or with, a, with an increase, how excited do you get when you get an increase? really excited I guess isn't it amen don't, don't only behave like only I get excited when I get an increase we all get excited yeah it's like how can I spend this money yeah come on we all, we all get excited and sometimes before that increase comes we make commitments for it already yeah we already bought those things without even even having it in our hand that happens sometimes but to the point is that we do get excited about you know, those forms of blessing in our life, in which we should. But there's a blessing that, as a child of God, that you have. Amen? Amen? Um, that Jesus said that the peace that he gives, the world could never give us. Nothing in this world could give the peace that only comes from God. And there are many people in search of peace in our day to day. Because we live in unrest and we live in you know, in uncertainties and in anxieties. But to the child of God, Jesus said, the peace that I give you, the world would never give you. And Paul writes of the, the peace of God in, um, in Philippians chapter 4. And he says that we are not to be anxious about anything, but through prayer and thanksgiving and bringing our supplications to God and we bring our requests. And then there's an assurance of what follows. What follows is the peace of God that he describes is above human understanding. That as a child of God, what you access from Jesus, our Savior, is the peace that even when there's unrest and even when there's chaos and even when there is calamity and even when there's uncertainties all around us, but the child of God walks in peace. And that's a blessing of God. And this morning, you know, as you come in here today, my hope is that you'll find strength in the presence of God. And my hope that as we sing these songs today is that you will encounter the peace of God and capture the peace of God in your life this morning in Jesus' name. So let's come around the throne of God today. Amen. And take a hold of the promise of God of strength and of peace today. Stand with me. Father, thank you for this morning. And as we worship together, and as we honor you together, and as we look to you on this morning, Father, 
Lord, have your way and be enthroned. Lord, be exalted and Lord, be magnified. And Lord, have your way in our gathering. Lord, there are people who have come in, Lord, from far and wide and gathering in here with us today. And Lord, they, they find themselves, Lord, here on this morning. Could have been anywhere else, but they are here. Lord, some maybe, maybe have just dragged themselves into this place. Maybe some, Lord, have, have come in here, maybe weary or tired. Maybe some who have just walked in here, maybe, Lord, just uncertain. Maybe, Lord, confused. Maybe some who have walked in here, maybe their minds are, are, are not here. Maybe somewhere else, because maybe of some of the things that they are dealing with. But God, I thank you that here in this place, you arrest their heart, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And Father, I pray that you give strength to the weary and you empower the weak. And Lord God, that the promise of your word is of peace today that you bless them with. And they will encounter that in your presence this morning, Father God. We thank you, we honor you, <coughs> and we praise you today. So as we worship, Lord, have your way and be enthroned by what you hear, Lord God. In Jesus' name we ask this this morning. Amen. Amen. Come, let's worship together. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Through the dark, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my Lord. spoken I am forgiven the king of kings called me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living let's sing it out the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is the victory and how
his name, exalt the Lord our God, and sing with us, hallelujah, praise the Lord, sing it out, hallelujah, from the front to the back, death has lost its grip on me, well, you, you have broken every chain, there's come together and as we look to the Lord this morning, you know, you have um, communion this morning and, you know, um, if you can maybe take it out, if you can, and um, our guys can just maybe hold on and, on those songs this morning. Um, I just want to take us back to this, this very hymn that we sung. And this is very unplanned right now and that's why they went to the next song already. Um, but we sung in a, a, such a profound hymn. On this morning, um, on the reflection of Jesus today. And you know, the thing is, is, you don't have to do communion at the end or, you know, at some other point of a service, or you can do it right now. Yeah, there's no structure to it, you understand? And so I know I'm, I'm interrupting the regular broadcast, yeah, because you're getting ready to clap your hands and want to praise, but I'm interrupting it now by speaking. And that is our First Corinthians. You know, you get to First Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul says, he says, On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that is broken for you. And in the same manner, he took the cup saying, this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood that was poured out for you. For in as often as you eat of the bread and you drink of the cup, you show the Lord's death until he comes. The profoundness of this hymn that we, we just sung out, Hallelujah, praise the one who set us free. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set us free. Hallelujah. If the, has anybody been bound? Has anybody has been enchained? Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for to, that he set me free. He delivered me. He, he sanctified me. He washed me. He cleansed me. He came to my rescue. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, come on, hallelujah to, to, the, to King Jesus, 
to King Jesus. You know, the morning that came, that sealed out the promise. What is the promise? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Then came the morning that sealed that promise that the body of Christ had laid dead in a tomb. And it, the enemy and all of hell thought, yeah, it's over. The plan is over. But the promise was sealed when that body started to breathe again. That body started to breathe again. That body began to breathe again. And we, we celebrate what we call Resurrection Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. And this morning, you see, when we come to commune and we, we're on worship and we're on the communion today, what do we celebrate? That if He lives, I live. Amen? If He lives, I live. We are made alive in, we are made alive in, in Christ Jesus, what Paul says. And this morning, as you hold the bread and the juice today, the body and the blood of Jesus that is represented through the cup that we partake of today, this is the wine. The words that we just sung out today. And the hymn that, that's gone out and gone forth this morning. It's become real in your heart today. As we commune with Jesus. Amen. Come, let's break bread this morning together. Thank you, Lord, for your body and your blood that was broken for us. And we do this in remembrance, Lord. As we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, Lord, this morning, we do show your, your death till you come, Lord. For this moment, we are ready, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, we can break bread together, Lord, and partake of communion, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And go back to regular schedule, guys. <laughs>
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's go around this morning and let's say hello to somebody if we can. Maybe just find a few people. Let's welcome them to church this morning. Say hi to them if you can. Do that this morning. And Amen. Let's just do that and let's go and say hello and bless them this morning. Welcome them to church. And yeah, it's amazing just to be here this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Let's welcome them. And you guys, can we have some lights, please? Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. Peace on earth. Goodwill to all mankind. Amen. That was the announcement, isn't it? Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Amen. Goodwill to all mankind. Praise the Lord. Oh, oh, glory and honor. Oh, blessing. Because your name alone is worthy. You're worthy forever. The praise is yours. Oh, glory and honor. Yeah. And all. Oh, Oh, glory, blessing and power, because your name alone is worth. You're worthy forever. All the praise is yours. Amen. Not unto us, amen, but unto him be the glory forever and ever. How long? Yeah, not just forever forever and ever. Amen. So welcome to church this morning. Good to have you with us. If there's anyone visiting with us this morning, uh, we have a welcome card at our door. You're most welcome just to fill that out, pop it back to us, and uh, we'll get in touch with you. Um, I'm going to call on our leaders. We're going to take about love gifts and our offerings today, and as they come to help us, um, and as you would hold your seed and free will offering you'd like to give online, you can always just go onto our website and you'll see you can just follow the prompts there as well. As you hold your seed, let's just pray with Father. Thank you for this morning. We have to give and we have to sow in your kingdom. Uh, bless every home this morning. And those who don't have work, Lord, I know you'd make a way, Heavenly Father. Lord, even in this tough and difficult environment that we find ourselves in economically, but God, you are, you are our provider. Lord, even when, when Paul sat in prison, he said, my God will supply my needs and according to his riches in glory. And today, Lord, we pray that over every family, your very provision and supply and for our businessmen and women, Lord, here, and we're trusting you for work by faith. I know you would make a way. For those that are here unemployed, God, my Father, I pray you'd make a way. And Lord, I know you would keep and sustain your children even through this difficult time, Lord, in Jesus' name. Our eyes are on you, Lord. Thank you that, Lord, you meet every need as we give thanks and honor to you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, leaders, as you help us this morning. Um, so, we have a few announcements. Um, church, well, it's 7.30 and 9.30, and then kids' ministry is closed for this week uh, due to um, the school holidays. So, um, they're going to be closed. Prayer is on Tuesday and on, is on Saturday as, as well. And then uh, Wednesday, kids' ministry is also closed. Thursday and Saturday is outreach work that our church does. And then our youth ministry is closed for the next two weeks. So youth will only begin on the 20th of October uh, again. So, yeah, next two weeks is going to be closed. And then we have our uh, men's conference that's going to be coming up. And um, the Lord, you know, Pastor Jen this week asked me, so, you know, so, so give me a word. Just just tell me. Give me a word that, that, that will describe what, or, 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 or the intention of your heart, or maybe what the Lord just dropped into your heart. And it's just so happened that on that morning, I was asking the Lord, well, give me one word, you know, that I can, I can maybe just build it around. And the word is blueprint. Blueprint. And um, you see, God has set a blueprint into motion. 
And what I realized about his blueprint, you walk within the, the boundaries of his blueprint, his blessing will follow. But outside of that blueprint, we're not going to encounter the blessing of God. There's a plan that God has ordained, God has put into motion. And the, the problem is this, is that we're trying to detest what God made. The problem with it is that we're trying to alter what God made. We are trying to change the plan that God had. It, it's like this. You know, who's the most important person in an aircraft? And with regards to an aircraft. And you all may say it's the pilot. But you know the pilot just gets to fly? The person that's the most important person in that aircraft is the designer. The one who designed the aircraft. Because the ins and the outs and the purpose of every part and the purpose of every bolt, you know the, the pilot doesn't know that. The pilot's only going to, he's only going to fly, do you know that? That's all he's going to do. The most important person is the person that put, put that plane together, who designed it. Because it's in their heart. And this morning, you know, when we look at life and we look at the way the world is going to, it is you and I that have to make a decision on whether we follow the blueprint of God or we yield to the pressures of this world and this life. But within the boundaries of the blueprint of God lies the blessings of God. And to capture that, we've got to follow the blueprint of God. So men, the 21st of October, I send a message out. We've got, till, we've got two, more, two more weeks to actually register for it. And um, Raymond is the guy to RSVP. His number is up there uh, on screen. And if you're attending, please um, send, it, send it across to him. Um, and so, yeah, we, we can get our, our numbers in order. Um, and please don't do this. Because at the ladies' conference, it happened. Right? Don't do this. Don't, don't trouble him after the registration's done. Yeah? Of wanting to come. Um, and then we decide. We've got two weeks to decide, church. Amen? Two more weeks. So, be decisive. Amen? Unless it's, it's work. You know? Then, then it's different, you know? But um, we can't go on the basis, I don't know how I'm going to feel then. We can't. You can't base that, isn't it? That's, that's, you, we can't base those kinds of reasonings. That's just, that's just like an old way from the 50s we're thinking that way. You understand? Be, be assured if you're attending, you're attending. You're not attending, but don't trouble him after the 15th of October because he's in charge of it. He's in charge of the numbers. So don't trouble him. He's already unwell. Don't make him more unwell, yeah? And give him more stress. If you're attending, guys, please send through your, your details. And then he'll be able to just, just confirm all of our numbers. We need to confirm on the basis of catering because the orders need to, to head out by the 15th, the evening of the 15th, right? So that's the reasons why we have to, to do that. So please, yeah, if you're attending, make certain that you RSVP to Raymond. Thank you, everybody. God bless you. All right, thanks, guys. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. So Andrea came after a long time back because she's writing with Trick. And she's um, doing, uh, she's doing the lyrics this morning and she's doing my sermon. And uh, yeah, I just surprised her. I gave her all my scriptures now. So. <laughs> So if she has the wrong scripture on, bear with her because it's my fault. I gave it. I, I, yeah, you know me. Amen. I'm like Jesus. I never change. <laughs> <laughs> I remain the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So, yeah. Unless I teach them how to work under pressure, I teach them for the work world, yeah? Got to be smart on your feet, yeah? Yeah, anyway. <laughs> um. So over the last few weeks, uh, Pastor Jen shared an incredible word last week. 
prior to that, I spoke, I spoke about the signs of the coming of Jesus out of Matthew 24. And I said this, that we are living in, in the time of where the church need, it should be readying itself and preparing itself for the return of the Lord. And we shared some signs that Jesus spoke about in, in Matthew 24 of what would be. And it was since that sermon that I preached, you know, um, there's been further signs that we see within, within the context of our world. I'm not saying because I preached that sermon, but I think it just makes, or it rather opens your eyes to see of what the Lord has said in Matthew 24. That we're living in, indeed, the end time. And we are living in, in indeed, the time when the Lord's return is imminent. And um, the week after, I spoke about the rapture of the church. And that the, the reading of God's church to be evacuated. Because what will follow is the tribulation. And the seven years of tribulation. And then the Lord will return. That will be his second coming. To rule for a thousand years. With the saints of God. Um, and we spoke a bit about the rapture. And we spoke a bit about what it entails. And that you and I as God's church must be prepared. For the rapture of the church. Of Jesus Christ. And let me say this is that the Lord's coming is very soon. And I know, you know, if you've been in church for a long time and if you've been maybe born and raised in church and you're, you're older now, you probably would have heard that. You've probably heard that Jesus is coming soon. Um, you probably would have heard songs being sung about it and many messages just being preached about it. But I don't think there's a greater urgency than now. And there's, there, there, there's no greater revelation of the return of the Lord than what we see in the now. We see it through the generation we're living in. We're seeing it through the signs of the weather phenomenon that the world calls a global warming. Um, we see it through, you know, the economic crises that are, that are taking place, not just in our country, but across the world. We see a pestilence and a pandemic that hit the world, that, that halted the world from its movement. We see the agendas that was passed through that time frame. We see further agendas that are, they are gaining momentum and acceleration within our world that is contrary uh, to you and how you and I have been designed and how we've been made by God and created by God. Um, it's evidencing itself even in more than in the now. And one of the things that, that, you know, about the sign of the coming of Christ and of, of the rapture of the church of what it would be is that, um, is that it would be like in the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, what happened is that people were not believing that the Lord was going to send a flood. But only Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And he prepared by building an ark. And I'm saying to you this morning to have your heart ready for the return of Christ. Um, because we learned in the Bible, the last sermon that I preached, and I'm sharing this because obviously we had a week break from what I've been speaking about, um, is that it'd be like a thief in the night. And no thief warns you when they come in. They don't put a note under your door saying, tonight I'm going to break into your house. It's going to be like a thief in the night, quick and sudden. And we, and we realize that and we, you know, through, through the word of God, that's what the Lord said. Be quick. You know, two will be in the field. One will be taken. It means it will be chaos. It's like, where's, where's everybody? They're gone. You know, they'll be lifted off. And, 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 you know, some would say, like, ah, that's like, you know, it's fantasy. But you know that to a generation at once in the 1800s, Flying was a, was a fantasy. Driving in an automobile, like a car, in the 1800s would have been a fantasy. Switching on a light would have been a fantasy. Flushing a toilet, let's not go that far, right? Let's look at, not in this big engineering thing, but flushing a toilet, flushing your business away, right? What in, in the 1800s, not even the 1800s, even part of the 1900s, some of us sitting here, you know that. Some of us may not have known that, obviously, you know, post, like, democracy. But prior, some of us would have never even, like, growing up in our growing up days, would not have had running water through the taps. Would have known that. So having such advancements is like, that's like a miracle. It's a miracle. You know, when the Wright brothers in, in the late 1800s into the early 1900s, when they were 
putting together a plane, they were working in a bicycle shop. That's where they were working, and they were thinking about flying. And to their generation, they would have been silly. There would have been people that were, you know, is that I don't think the Wright brothers would have ever thought that people would have what would be called a private jet. I don't think. They were just trying to go up into the air, leave alone flying from one country to the next. When, when, when people were on ships through the 1800s that were wind-driven, I don't think they would have thought it would be motor-driven and then eventually becoming like, you know, in terms of, of, of generating power, uh, being, being nuclear ships that would be generated that way. I don't think they would have even imagined that. And then to have what we have on ships today, I mean, some of us go on to the MSCs and all these cruise ships, to have cinemas on it, to have swimming pools on it, to have dance floors and pubs on it, and to have restaurants in it. I mean, those chaps were just sitting and carrying grain on wind-driven ships to the advancements. So don't tell me this here. Ah, that's unthinkable. Today, you don't need a, a cord. You don't need a cord to call anybody. Anybody remember the days of when you had to pull the cord? Anybody? And then you, you, you know how improved it was for us? Where you could put an extension cord and take it to the next room. Wow. And then further to that, you're able, anybody can remember that curly thing that you should attach to your phone? Yep. Initially, it should be a short one. And then somebody was so genius, made it longer. So that you could leave the phone there and you could walk. Yeah. And then eventually, you got a cordless phone at home. Anybody that had an answering machine on that there? And you should get excited when somebody phones and leaves, an answer, leaves a message there. You just want to see who called. Not that you're going to return. Now it's like an irritation to have voicemail, yeah? But do you remember those days? So what you have at, at your disposal this morning that you hold in your hand? You remember the days when you had cash? Now it's a headache to have cash around. So we're moving towards the rapture of the church. And the point is this, you've got to have your heart ready. This morning, I've entitled this sermon, Follow Jesus. More than anything that I want to communicate to you this morning, and more than anything that I want to leave with you today, I want to leave with you this morning the thought of following Jesus. That's all. The simplest thing of being born again, blood washed, and a child of God, the simplest thing is that you follow Jesus every day. That's all. It's simple as that. We complicate it. We, make, we try to make it very profound and very deep. But the most simplest thing in the day that we're living in right now is that you and I, are to be responsible to follow Jesus. You see, as I shared, we, we're living in the last days. And I'm going to speak a little bit out of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And 2 Timothy chapter 3 speaks about the culture of what the last days is going to be like. And in the midst of all of that, and that we're going to see and you know, witness, and I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of time of, 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 of what will be evidenced in the last days. But I want to challenge you in the aspect of following Jesus. In a world and in a time of when we are encouraged to follow others through social media um, uh, uh, platforms, um, and we are encouraged by that. And, you know, we get excited when, not only when somebody that you follow, but when they follow you back. And especially if they're a person of prominence. Yeah? Imagine if you, if you are an Ed Sheeran fan and you follow him, and then he follows you back. You'll never sleep for a week. You'll just be looking at that. He followed me back. He followed me back. Honey, you. Oh, imagine that. He starts singing for you after. Whoa, he followed me back. Don't act like you don't know who's Ed Sheeran. Yeah. Yeah, he'll do all this. Act all religious here. Yeah. Please. Okay, let's go UB40, right? It's maybe back then. And maybe they follow you back. How happy would you be? Really excited. Really. It's like if your wife or her husband, I'm not worried about you. You follow me every day. You like my tail. I'm more interested in, yeah, they follow us back. We're encouraged in that. And we, 
get excited about that. I want to challenge you about you following Jesus. You following Jesus and following in the footsteps of Jesus more than anything else in the world we live in. So are you ready? You ready? In the back, you ready? In the corners, you are ready? On the wings, you ready? If you're not, I'll put the air cons a little bit down so then we'll prep ourselves and get ready. Don't get too comfortable on the seats you're in. Be ready with me. Stay alert. Um... And I hope you do take away from this morning's sermon. That's my introduction. Second Timothy. Now, I don't have three voices all are out of action. One's in Live Village. Other one got an infection. And the other one's coming to the second service, which is my wife. She'll be at the second service. So I'm without a narrator. Who would love to take the challenge on? Who would love to? Anybody? We're only waiting for you. The long because you know I'm, I can't read. You know that. Yeah. It's not like okay, I'll do it. All right. It's not going to happen. So I'm asking anyone who'd like to help me. Thanks, Nels. You see, that's the thing of society. We're always waiting for somebody else to do it. Thanks, Nels. Right, Matt, you got it? It's going to come up and scream. Second Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read the entire passage of Scripture. Is that all right? And even if it wasn't all right with you, it's, we're still going to read it, right? <laughs> From verse number 1, we're reading out of the New King James Version of the Bible. Pay close attention to the first five verses. There's certain points I'm going to like, just stop us there to pay attention to. Right, let's go for it. But know this, that in the last days, terrorist times, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, lost, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. From such people, turn away. You see that? Just stop right there. From such, turn away. Pay. All right? We're going to get back and we, we will explain a bit further into detail about what Paul is, is saying. Here. Let's just read on. Verse 6. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to as, Jan as Janus and Yambras resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith. But they will progress no fair, mm -hmm. for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecution, affliction, which happened to what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord <coughs> delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Spirit are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. And as I shared, give me wisdom in Jesus' name. Take glory, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so I shared in context, and I shared thus far of, of where we've come to. Is this morning, I want to speak to us about what the last days would look like. What the last days would look like. And it is Paul was writing this letter and epistle to Timothy, who was a younger minister in the faith. And when you read through the first and the second letters, but we are in the second letter, 
It begins in the second letter by um, Paul, you know, um, um, affirming the faith that, 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 that Timothy had, a faith that didn't just come out of thin air, but that, that Timothy received from his family, his mother and his grandmother, who were incredible women who served God. And um, Paul encouraged Timothy to continue in that way, to continue on the path of, of faith, that God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound mind. And to preach without hesitation, preach without apology, but preach the word and stay true to the word of God. And through this letter, we, we find that Paul encourages Timothy to do so. We come into chapter 3, and then Paul now speaks about what the last days would be like. And what you can be assured of that, and what I'm just so encouraged about as well, is that we can know this is that the gospel didn't just stop at Jesus, or it didn't just stop at Paul. It is sort of like a baton being handed over, isn't it? And handed over to somebody is that, you know, because you, you're going to see that as you get to chapter 4, that Paul says, you know, I fought the good fight and I finished my race and I kept the faith. It's sort of like, there's the baton, Timothy, now you keep running. He starts by, by saying to, 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 to Timothy that the last days will be perilous times. Now, when you think about the last days, some scholars will say, well, the last days has, has been gone and it's over. But I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, Jesus hasn't come back. But the minute that the Lord was ascended, there's preparation and expectation of his return. So the evidence of what the last days will be like would have been evidenced through Timothy's life and continued until Jesus returns. So to an extent... What Paul was speaking about to Timothy would have been evidenced in, 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 in Ephesus. But I think that you and I cannot be naive or be arrogant to think that, you know, that we aren't living in the last days. For what Paul has been speaking about in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is universal and, 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 and is still applying to us in our day today. And, I, and as I shared already is that I don't think that with regards to the last days and the signs of the coming of Christ, that it has been more clear that the Lord is coming than in the day that we're living in now. So he speaks about the last day to Timothy of what it looked like until the Lord returns. And some of the things that, that he begins to speak about that I just sort of compiled it into, well, firstly, is that it's going to be perilous and for us to understand what, what, what it means to be, you know, and, and what is perilous, sorry, my tissue. Um, perilous is dangerous times. Is that the times of the Lord's return will be, it, it'll be a time of where we wouldn't have thought that our societies will get to. It'll be perilous. And he gives an entire list of, of what those days will look like and what the culture of people, what men will be, what people will be like, a culture. How people will live. Now there's 20 things that he, that he speaks about. I counted 20 things. Now if I have to like use 20 things as 20 points, we'll sit here till the afternoon. And I don't want to really focus too much of that. Because I want to get to a point of what you would do and what I should be doing when the culture is, is living in this way. So when he speaks about men and he speaks about people, he means about the culture, the, the kind of people that will be in our, in our generation. So can we just maybe read through it again, just from verses 1 through to 5 again, Matt? Then I'll, I'll, I'll just... Now, Paul lists it out. There's a list. Let's go for it. Uh, next, next, next slide here. Yep. For? For men will be lovers of themselves. Yeah, let's, let's stop right there. Now, there's nothing wrong with loving yourself because we should have a great self-esteem. We should. Because how are you going to love your neighbor if you can't love yourself? We are supposed to love your, your neighbor. Jesus said this, love your neighbor as yourself. So you've got to build a self-love. You've got to have a self-esteem. But I think in the generation, more clear it's being seen, I think, now than ever before. That people have become lovers of Themselves. And 
I think, you know what, and this is not to like speak ill about it or anything of the sort, but I think that a camera on the front of our phone says it all. Amen? We are self-consumed in our generation. That's the culture. We are self-consumed. It's self first, then others. In our current generation and the culture that we find ourselves in. You know, people have put up walls when we came from a generation when people didn't have walls around them. You remember the days of community living? When people shared with each other. People took care of each other. But I think that's so far from our culture today. You've noticed that? People are self-consumed. It has to be about them. And if it is not about them, then sometimes it becomes a problem. Self-consumed. So he says, in the last day, what the culture will be like, what the people will look like, they will be self-seeking. What else? Let's read on. Lovers of money. Should we say any further to that? Do you know how much people love money? Do you know that people love money more than people? Do you know that? Do you know that people will do anything for money, including killing a family member, including, uh, uh, you know, standing upon people? The lovers of money, they will, they will even involve themselves in crime. They will sabotage things along the way. Come on, don't tell me we don't live, you know, in that kind of world today. Money, where people will give up law, will, will sell their soul for money. The interest of people today and in the world we're living in right now is how much do you have in your bank account? And don't get me wrong, we all need money to live. Money. But the love of money? People love it to bits. I mean, you can take their family away and they'll still be happy. But take their money? Ask somebody to give you their wallet. We've become so consumed with money in our generation today. How much somebody earns? The love of it. You often ask yourself the question, how much more money do people need in our world today? We have these extremes of people having so much and then people that have nothing. There are people in our world today that can alleviate poverty. Do you know that? But because of greed. Do you know that companies today, if you want to know, if you know what companies will do, companies will dispose of good food just so that they can keep the demand. Do you know that? Are you aware of that? They will dispose of it. They will, just so that the demand can stay. Can you believe that? There are people in our world today that own 80% of the wealth of the world, but they're only 20%. They can alleviate poverty in the world today. You always think about it. You think about, you know, I love sport. You, you, you guys know that. I love it. I, I really do. And I always got to like warn myself, be careful. Be ca always, always got to be careful. Because I love it. I grew up with sport. I've been a sporting person from, from my childhood years. Loved it to bits. I should play cricket with socks. That's how I loved it. I should hit stones. I loved it. I, I, I promise I should bust my toes thinking it's a soccer ball. But I'm kicking stones. Love sport. Loved it from, from, the very, from very young. Loved it from very, very young. And, and sport right now is no longer sport. It has so much to do with money. When I think about the kinds of salaries that that sportsmen and women are being offered to, to go into certain parts. I'm not going to mention those, those parts of the world, but to go to certain parts of the world. I know of one soccer player right now who's earning 3 million euros a week. 3 million euros a week to play football. And that is this, to work one day, which is the day of when they would jump onto that field. Three, I, I, don't get me wrong. A football player, is, as, as, to, to play professional football, Man, it takes a lot of effort. But 3 million euros a week, 3 million euros a week, you multiply that by 20. That's the salary for a week. Not for a lifetime, for a week. And that kind of money is being thrown around. And, I always, and that person that went, went for 3 million euros already has a lot of money. Already has a lot of money and doesn't really need the money. And, and would say this, you know, the more money I get, the more good I would do. I'm trying to think, how much, really? Really? 
We'll give 1% of that, 1%. And we're saying we're doing so much of good, 1%. Where's the days of when you played football for the love of the game? And instead, take the 3 million euros and say, guys, I don't need it. Because I've already got, let's pump that into, into some, some area out in wherever he comes from. And, oh, or maybe across the world. Let's put it in there. For the next year, let's take all of that money. I'll play for free. Take all of that money and invest it in the lives of people. But that doesn't happen in our world today, isn't it? it we call wishful thinking. Why? Because what's driving our society is the love of money. That's what's going on in our society today. I don't want to spend too much time. Let's read on. Boasting. Ah. You're on social media today. And there are things that should never get posted on social media, yeah? You know that. But the culture of the day, come on, boastful. Let's read on. Proud. Proud, isn't it? Pastor James spoke about that. Let's read on. Blasphemers. Blasphemers. The name of God. Have you ever known, have you ever watched a movie? Have you ever watched a movie? Where they would have ever said, hey, for Allah's sake, or for Krishna's sake, man. And believers, you are to blame. Because you also take the name of God in, in vain. Do you know that? You, you, you take his name in vain. Blasphemers, the name of Jesus. How often you hear it in the movies, but not for good, but as a swear word. Blasphemers. But on, let's read on. Disobedient to parents. Parents, should I say anything about that? About the state of children in our day today? And the state of the culture of our children that are being reared in the world today? And the rebellion around us? Paul says the last days will look like that. There were things that, that as parents you think about. If you ever told your, your father that way, if you ever spoke to your mother that way, do you remember that? Do your children say the same thing about you? You know, if I ever speak to my mother that way. Hello? You see, it's, 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 it's then the, the, adopt, the, the adopting of a new culture of what's going on with our kids in our world today. And what Paul says, in that day, not, that, that in the last days, that yes, it's going to start with you, Timothy, and in Ephesus, but also what that day will look like in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is that there'll be disobedience of children to their parents. Let's go on, Matt. Unthankful. Unthankful. People aren't grateful anymore, isn't it? Un just, there's expectations more. They, they, like, like in a culture we're living in, we think that we're entitled to everything. And gratitude is missing in our generation. Let's read on. Unholy. Unholy. We don't live holy lives, pure lives. Because why? Grace the church, this is, remember this is addressing the church, by the way. But the culture of society, unholy, let's go on. Unloving, unloving and unforgiving, yeah? Unloving. We've lost what it, what it means to truly love somebody. And we hold grudges. We're unforgiving. He says that's what the culture would be like. Why must I forgive that person? The culture we're living in. So you know, Slanderers, Slanderers isn't it? Bike, backbiting, pick up a phone, gossip about somebody else. Let's read on. Without self-control. Self We're living in that day today, isn't it? Where there's no boundaries. Boundaries. Boundaries are, are constantly being moved. Without self-control. Yeah, read on. Brutal. A culture we're living in is brutal. That, that people will, will not hesitate to kill somebody. Brutal. That we... That we, we, see, we see institutions more than people. Brutal. We're living in a day right now where war has been, is, is currently happening in the Ukraine. And the brutality there that's going on. The war crimes that have happened through our generation. And brutality, it seems like it's increasing in its intensity. It's getting worse. There are things that's going on in our culture today. That is so brutal. In our country, when the stats were given out by our police, not commissioner, but police minister, in the, in the last year, you know you get financial reports? They give crime stats. And the crime stats of murders was 27,000 murders in our country. 
27,000. We only have 365 days, people. And if you take 365 days, and if you try to work out that 27,000 murders, and you work out the average murder per day, is, it's, between, it's about 75 murders a day in this country that we're living in. Men have become brutal. The rape of a child, the rape of women, the abuse on women in the day we're living in, brutal. That's the culture we're living in. You know, despising the good. <sighs> People don't like good anymore. I shared this before. Good stories don't make the news. We despise something that's good and honest and, and pure. It cannot be good. We despise what is good. Let me tell you this here. Any, any movie that, that, that promotes good will never make it in the, in the cinema screens. You know that? A, a, any series that, is, that will promote. Do, have you noticed that how series have gone? You remember the days of when you used to watch series with your entire family? Now you can't watch those series anymore. You're going to be scared because it starts off nice and the next thing it just flips. The scripts just starts flipping. You know? All the, family, all the family stuff that you used to watch before. I know some of you used to watch all the, the, the soapies, but, but also we had family, you know, family sitcoms. You remember the family sitcoms you should sit and watch and, and laugh as a family? Everybody loves Raymond and all of those things and Seinfeld. Anyone like Seinfeld and Cheers? Anyone can remember that day, late night viewing? <laughs> I say late night, it's 10 o'clock. Cheers, is, it wasn't that it's bad. It's that it's just, it's just late in the evening, yeah. We were not allowed to watch it. But it was funny. Yeah, anybody? You know, my wife and kids. Anyone? Yeah? Hey, Belky and Larry. Anybody? Perfect strangers. Hey, married with children. Hey, Al Bundy. Hey, I'll never forget Al Bundy, guys. Al Bundy. Yeah. Love and marriage. Yeah, it goes together like a horse and carriage. Hey, Al, 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 Al was, I won't say he's my hero. No, he got it. But Al as a husband, man, gosh. What about according to Jim, guys? According, you remember those days? It's missing. Have you noticed that? It's gone out of our culture because we become despisers of what is good. It's a culture, you know? Preaching. Ah. The prayers. Brothers will betray brothers. Sisters will betray sisters. Best friends betray each other. Traitors. You know? Strong, yeah, haughty, haughty, haughty spirits. You know, lovers of pleasure. In the culture we're living in today, people rather head head to the beach. People rather. I'm not saying that's happening in our church. I'm just saying, but we become lovers of pleasures more. Our sporting arenas can gather more people than the house of God. You go to the UK. UK has the best soccer league in the world. Can gather thousands of people, even even. Even a second-tier football team will join thousands when you walk into those churches. Those people have become lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. That's a culture. You know? Having a form of godliness. Words like, oh, I'm blessed. And you think that person is a Christian. That word blessed is used all the time by everybody these days. I'm so blessed. And, and you think because it, it, it exists in the Bible, so that person must be saved. And then they say they go to church, but is they going to church a form of godliness? It's just like a form. It's something that I do. Or is there really a walk with God? Denying the power of, denying the power of the word of God. Faith. He says, that's the culture. That's what culture is going to look like. The last days, when you look around, this is what's going to be evident. These 20 things, some of you can say, is very existent in our generation today. Today. Now, a previous generation would have said, yes, it's existing there as well. But I think to the extent and to the levels of what we find ourselves in, you know why I say that? You see, when my dad grew up, there was no professional footballers. There was no professional sportsmen. Do you know that rugby only turned professional after the 1995 World Cup? Prior to that, Rugby players like Francois Pinard after the World Cup, after, after um, uh, um, Nelson Mandela gave him the trophy, they had to get up and go to work the next day. It was only after that World Cup it became professional. That's not too long ago, isn't it? 
and to the extent of where it's gone to now and the kinds of money that exists now. You see, in the last 25, 30 years, we're starting to see what, what Paul has mentioned here about what the last days will look like. It's sort of what you and I are living in now. What do you do? What do you do as a child of God? What do you do as a believer? What do you do? What do you do? Do you conform to the pattern of the world? Do you conform to this culture? Because this is the culture. This is the way of life that people are going to live by. This is going to be their part of their DNA. What's, what's sort of, it's, it's in, sort of in, within them. Not they were born with it, but what they would, what they establish as, as they believe patterns and will live in this way. You and I are evidencing this in our society of what people are becoming and what culture is becoming. But what do you do as the child of God? What do you do? The first thing that he says at the end of verse 5, he says, turn away from such people. And there's an exclamation mark. Can you see that? Which means it was exclaimed. And when you, when you use an exclamation mark, you often use it as a warning. It's a warning sign, yeah? Beware, exclamation mark. You don't, see, you don't ever see this, beware, emoji smiley face. You don't see that. You, you ever seen that? Beware. You ever saw that over there? <laughs> Anyone there? Woo-hoo. Yeah. You don't see that. No. But when they say, be careful, be watchful, be alert, be vigilant, have your eyes open, especially when they say, beware of dogs. No smiley face there. They're saying, watch where your foot is going to tread on. Because why? They might be poor on the floor, but more especially, there might be some teeth to bite you. Be careful. And he says, when you see this in the world, and when you see this in the last day, and you see this in, in the midst of what culture and what life is going to be like, he says, but you, Timothy, what you need to do is turn away. In other words, don't turn towards, turn away. Walk away. Oh, but pastor, it will offend people. Pastor, it will offend them. You know? How are we going to save them if we don't live like them and be with them and understand them? There's an instruction given out of the word of God. Of such, don't have anything to do with them. Don't have anything to do with that kind of culture. Turn away. That's the first thing that we can, we can I think, arrive to as a child of God in the last days that we're living in. Make certain that you don't live that way. Make certain that's not your culture. Make certain that that's not your lifestyle. Make certain of what Paul made, made mention of the, in the first five verse. You make, you see, no one else can establish that within you, only but you. Only but you. So this sermon is not about, like, so, like, what about, it, it, it has nothing to do with me. This is about you because Paul addresses this within the heart of Timothy. Make certain that you turn away from such people. Don't involve yourself with such individuals. Don't bring that a part of your culture. Don't allow that within your lifestyle. It'll pollute you. That's all it'll do. It'll pollute you. Make certain that you live differently. So it means you turn away from that. If that's what the culture is like, make certain that that is not evident in your life. That's what he's saying. And the thing is this, the culture that we're living in today looks like that. But it doesn't mean that we've got to be that. It doesn't mean that we've got to live to that pattern. It doesn't mean that we've got to live in that way or in that manner. It doesn't mean. He then goes on, and then he speaks about women. And he speaks about how it creeps into, uh, you know, such individuals that live that way creeps into households and, and take captive of women. Now, he wasn't coming hard against women. You know, some people might use this here, especially, you know, if they're coming, you know, and, against women. This has nothing to do with women. You've got to always look at context. And the context of this is that, remember this here, during biblical times, men went to work. Ladies stayed at home. Ladies were not allowed to work. They were not. In biblical times, they were not allowed to work. So they stayed at home. So in staying at home, you can only wash so much of clothes. And you can only clean the house so much. And then thereafter, what do you do? So even in biblical times, there was idle, idle time. And what I believe is, is, is that he's not coming against women. He's coming against an idle mind and an idle way of life. Because the minute that you have, when, when you're idle, what's, what's, things are going to creep in. And 
He says, such things will creep in into where? The households. So don't tell me this here. There's stuff that's not creeping into your household. And you're wondering where it came from. And it's taken your house captive. Well, the thing is that you are an idol. And when you're an idol, you cannot move anywhere. Do you know that? There's no movement. The minute that you walk in being, being idle, you know, we, we know about an idle mind. We, we all know that. So you've got to keep busy. Now, the thing about this, why, would it not, why, why did it take hold of the woman? Because they were, at times, idle at home. Why, why didn't he make mention of men? Because where were they? They were at work. They were working. Their minds could not be engaged in this. They had to keep working. And the thing about this is that in, in our lives is that if you keep working with a purpose in mind, you can never be taken captive by what's going on. Because you're vigilant and alert. And there are things that are happening in households that are creeping into your house right now. That's only because the door's been left open. It's only been left open. And the thing is that in the last days of what's happening in households and in families, you would have never dreamt it would have happened 20 years ago. But it's taking place in households today. And I'm saying this this morning is that if it's crept in, it's time to creep it out. Yeah? It's time to kick it out. As the child of God, it's time to kick it out. Are you with me this morning? Are you listening to me here today? In the last days, this is what the world's going to look like. In the last days, it says deception is going to be part of it. He said men are going to get worse. He, he speaks about that. Men will get worse and worse. That's what will happen. That's what the culture will be like. But as a child of God, what are you to do? You are to turn away. What else are you to do? Verse 10. See what he says. Verse 10. Verse 10. He says, yeah. No, no, go to verse, verse 10, right? Let's go to verse 10 quickly. That's not verse 10. There. But we are carefully following. Yeah, that's verse 10. He says, so this is the culture, right? Evil men will be like, like Yamaris. What happened? They, they, they resisted the instructions of Moses. So men in the day that you're living in will resist instruction. You talk to them, they'll still go the other way. It means they'll be disobedient. That's, so disobedience will be prevalent in the hearts of men and women. He speaks about that in, in the last days. Corrupt households you'll see in the last days. And then the entire list that I gave you from verse number 1 to verse 5. But he says, turn away. Turn away from that way of life. What else? What else are you to do, Timothy, in such a time? Carefully follow. You see, Timothy carefully followed what? Now, this is, this is a list I like. First list, yeah, you know, it's, it's like it can sometimes like put you into a, in a bad mood. But watch the pattern of Paul's life. And he says, you've carefully followed my life. And the thing about this is that when he says that, is that, is that you know, and, and we've got to have like patterns to follow in. And if you think about Paul, Paul said this in one of his letters, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Isn't it? And he says this to, to Timothy, you've carefully followed my doctrine. So in you following my doctrine, you've actually been following Jesus. Because I follow Jesus. Amen? I follow Jesus. And he gives a list here. Let's read this list here out, right? Carefully follow. But we have carefully followed you as you yep. know. Yes, on my manner of life. My culture. How did I treat people? Did I love money or did I love people? How did I, was I deceiving of people? Was I kind towards people? What was my, my way of life? How did I honor people? Was I disobedient? Was I rebellious? Was I harsh? Was I rude? Was I brutal? Was, did I have a form of godliness in me? You see, you've carefully followed my doctrine the basis of what I believe in. And then you've watched how I live my life, yeah? I think that's so important, isn't it? In our day to day, how we're living our lives. Let's read on. Purpose. Yep, my purpose. Amen. So I'm not living in this aimless life where things can just creep in, this idle life. My purpose, what I've been designed for, built for. Let's read on. Faith. My faith, my trust in God. Yep, what else? Long my long sufferings that was within me, yep, and... 
my love, my perseverance, this, this never giving up, it's been on. my persecutions. You've watched my persecutions in my time in my life, even in the persecutions. What did I do? Let's be on. Afflictions. Whoa, he was afflicted a lot. What, what, wasn't Paul? Read on. Look at where it happened. This, this persecutions and afflictions didn't just happen once. It happened in Antioch, in Lyconium, in Lystra. Yep. Read on. <laughs> Next what, slide. Yep. What persecutions I endured. Yeah. Out of them all, the Lord delivered. Yeah, all of this. You've watched my life and you've carefully followed. You've carefully followed. Carefully followed. What else? What else did he instruct him in? Let's read on. So that's a, that's a statement, right? All who desire to live godly. So if you want to live this way, if you want to live against the culture of the day, like what is going to be evidence in the last day, I'm, I'm coming to an end, right? Is that you're going to be persecuted for it. It comes with the territory. If you choose to turn away, he's saying this, anyone who is... Who, who, who wants to live godly, anyone that wants to serve God, anyone wants to walk, you, what you must be prepared for is never a bed of roses. Welcome, my brother, in. He's such a model example of what it is to be a man. No, it's not going to happen. You're going to be persecuted for it. You know what? Yep. I shared this already. Yes, you don't have Right. Ah, but, but you, uh, turn to your neighbor and say must. So it's not an option to Timothy, isn't it? He says you must. There are musts in our lives, isn't it, that we must do. We must get up in the morning to go to work. We must take a shower. We must brush our teeth. There are musts, yeah? You must eat, huh? You must eat. You must drink water if you want to live long. Can't just rely on... Monster and dragon and Red Bull and all of those things. Yeah? You must. There are some musts, which are, when you use the word must, it means it's a non-negotiable. You can't negotiate on it. So he says, you must do what? But you must continue in the things which you have learned from ah. your children. So you've learned stuff. You've learned it from a child. You've learned from where? The Holy Scriptures. I'm, I'm hurrying along, right? You learn from the Holy Scriptures. In other words, from a young man, remember I shared in context that there was a faith that was built from his mother and his grandmom and was instilled with him as a young man and how he started growing the ways of the Lord. And here you find that Paul brings him back to that and reminds him this. So what you must do when you see the culture like this as a man of God, because remember this, Timothy is, is, is a preacher, he's a pastor, and he says that you're going to see the culture this way, but what you must do, you must continue in the things that you learned from when you were just a child. So continue in the faith. Continue in the love. Continue in serving God. Continue in following Jesus. Continue being filled in the Holy Spirit. Continue relying on the Word of God. Continue going back to prayer. Continue going back to fasting. Continue to watching out your life. Don't give up on that. Don't give up on that. Continue. So he says to him, when the culture looks this way, and it's being evidenced by you, Timothy. And I'm sharing with you this morning. When you see the culture this way, day, uh, this way and the last days in which we are living in, I would say to you, turn away from such people. Don't live that way. I would say to you, follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And I would say to you, continue in the path that you would have learned from a child in serving God. The simple thing of when you see the culture and, in, and the days that we're living in looks like 2 Timothy chapter 3. Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Make it a non-negotiable. I follow Jesus. I want to leave you with three passages of Scripture. Just three. And I'd love for you to stand with me. And I wish I had a little longer time, but I don't. There are three incredible passages of Scripture. Three. The first being Romans 1 and verse 16. Yeah. 
point to the power of love and transformation for everyone in the universe. And he's not suffering. In the culture we're living in today, and as we can all recognize, we're living in the last days. As a child of God that you and I got to live in, we got to live unashamed as being a child of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. The second passage of scripture is Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. It is the same Paul writing. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm crucified with Jesus. I'm surrendered to the Lord. And this life that I live is a life of faith in the Son of God who gave his life for me. To live in such a way, church. Surrendered. Unashamed, surrendered. And finally, is Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, Amen. who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Looking unto Jesus. Let's throw aside everything that entangles us, every sin that weighs us down. Let us take up our cross. Let's run the race. Let's run the race, church. Let's run the race that is being marked out for us, that the Lord has set before us. How do we do it? Look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus. Forget everything else, what you sing. Even men and women of God are going to fail. But look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of your faith. Look at him as the example of how to run. And as he sat at the right hand of the Father, one day, when I stand in glory, the words I want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy. Well done. When we take hold of the crown of righteousness, when we can say, truly, 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 I fought the good fight. I finished the race and I kept the faith. Now awaits for me in glory is the crown of righteousness. Church, man of God, woman of God, child of God, follow Jesus. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you. In a world, in a culture, in a day we're living in, and so evident through the word, we sing it, Lord, becoming more and more real to us. But help us to follow you. Help us every day. At our workplaces, at unis, at school, at homes, in our families. When each day is becoming more and more difficult, help us. We live in a manner of being unashamed. We live in a manner where we are surrendered. And when we are looking unto Jesus, we'll follow you with everything. God, my Father, I pray over our church. And let us run this race, Lord God, that you've marked out for us. And as we witness, Lord God, and wait in great expectation of your glorious return, help us to walk and live with perseverance today. In Jesus' name, we love you. Thank you for your church. As we go, go with each one. Keep us, watch over us, and use us for your glory. And thank you for this word. As we bless you and thank you and honor your name, in Jesus' name we pray. May the Lord bless and keep you. May he cause his face to shine on you, be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace, in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. Take care. We have coffee downstairs. Those that like to stay behind and meet between these two services, you can go downstairs under the green shake cloth. You can grab yourself a cup of coffee or tea and a, and a biscuit. Love you. Have a blessed day, blessed week. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please click like, comment, and subscribe. Also, hit the bell notification so that you'll get a notification every single time we upload. Stay blessed.